a panel on uh, smart water treatment, on water scarcity and the problems associated with it. If you attended the panel that was in here just before us, uh, the subject of which was on food security, the subject of water scarcity came up uh, a great deal. So they, uh, they uh, go together uh, very well. Uh, we have a large panel, and that may be because of the huge scale of the problem of water scarcity, water cleanliness, uh, and so forth. I'd like to introduce them, and then I'm going to ask each of them uh, to make their presentation for five to seven minutes, and then we have two expert commentators who will uh, offer their views, and then we'll open it up to your uh, questions and comments. Uh, I hope we have a stimulating discussion uh, today. Uh, to my left uh, is Suresh uh, Prabhu, uh, who is chairperson of the Council on Energy, Environment, and Water uh, in India. I'm going to call on him first because uh, he will be having uh, to fly out. He'll be leaving us uh, in the middle of this session. Then we have Blake Burris, uh, who is founder and chairman of Clean Web Initiative. J. Carl Ganter, managing director of Circle of Blue. Felix Karmazinov, who is director general of Vodokanal of St. Petersburg, then Andrei Kobzyev, co-founder and chief executive officer of Aquifer Company, Oran Kochavi, who is director of Terra Venture Partners, and, as I've, and then our two expert respondents, Arnold Brun, founder and CEO of Tenevia, and Olivier Conan, who will be back in a moment, uh, who is with 100 Innovations, very appropriate uh, for the focus of this uh, conference. So without further ado, thanking you for being here. I hope we have time for some of your questions and comments. I'd like to turn to Suresh Prabhu. Uh, as you very correctly pointed out, I don't see there is any other sector which is so critical to the global humanities as well as the global biodiversity survival as the water is. And unlike any other resource which is in short supply, one could manufacture it. It's not possible to manufacture water. And therefore, the only way we can actually manage these resources is by make sure, making sure that we put this scarce resource for a very productive, useful, and efficient use. If you want to do that, then obviously you need to find out where is the water used. In a countries, large countries with big population, as well as developing countries, the major use of water is for agriculture. In India, for example, we use 85% of our total water for agriculture. And therefore, if you want to, we have a limited availability of water and a very large demand for it, then you must come out with the solutions, the innovative ideas, when it's used for a particular purpose. So one of the innovative ideas that we must think about is how do you use water for agriculture in an efficient way. That would mean making use of every drop of water for something to produce far more than what we are using today. So that would also mean the combination of technologies of inputs, whether it's seeds, fertilizers, pesticides, and others, we should be used in conjunction with water and also looking at soil in a way that we can produce more. The second use of water in uh, many countries is for power generation. It's not hydroelectricity, because when you use water for hydropower generation, it's non-consumptive use of water. That means you can use the same water for something else. But when you are using thermal power, nuclear power, you need a lot of water for cooling purposes. So therefore, the power generation is one of the principal users of water in many parts of the world. 
so we need to find out solution how could we use maybe the cooling could take place not by water but maybe by some other means the third use is obviously for commercial purposes and now we are seeing the large urbanization that is taking place in the world where people are moving from rural areas into urban areas in china we had 400 million people who migrated from rural to urban areas in india we would have another 600 million people migrating into urban areas in the next 30 years so we need how to use water in urban areas for commercial purposes as well as for residential uses and that would mean urban water supply itself must undergo a very sea change in terms of recycling in terms of using water in a more efficient way in terms of it's coming it into the cities as well as its proper use then industry which is the user of water in also significant way because we need manufacturing and for manufacturing you need variety of uh, use of water so i think we really need to look at all this so if you really look at it in my opinion the best way to address this problem is by coming out with solutions at the level of use whether it's agriculture commercial industrial or otherwise and then to think about some new ideas about desalination of water because could we think about using solar energy for desalinating water because the countries we have vast coastline can use part of the saline water sea water for potable of uses of others if we can use the energy which is not fossil fuel based because the water is also at the receiving end of climate change because of large use of fossil fuel emission and therefore we really need to come out with new ideas new thinking and i think innovation is something which could really bring about that possibility suresh because you're going to be uh, leaving us uh, if i may ask uh, a question uh, of you uh, you mentioned recycling of water uh there's some controversy about that interestingly uh, not too many weeks ago uh in las vegas which has it's the fastest growing city in the united states and it has an acute water scarcity problem and so uh, recycling is is being talked about what they did was to bring a celebrity comedian on stage and they filmed while they brought a plastic bottle looking just like this uh, for him except for one thing that was different it had written on the label this water was made from sewerage now we can call this white water you know the difference between gray water and black water he was given a bottle of black water that had been purified well he's well known in uh, las vegas he looked at it for a moment and then he drank it to the best of my knowledge he is still alive uh how far has recycling of water gone in the indian context is it a serious uh matter there no you are absolutely right in fact i recall in singapore water week the prime minister of singapore did the same thing he showed us the water which is coming from sewers how it getting recycled and finally how it becomes potable and he actually had that water he drank that water so i think it is a, not really a luxury uh, that we can afford to have so it's a no choice we are really to not to recycle the water i think we are doing it but not on the scale at which we should be doing it so we use recycling of water in some areas many hotels are using it many commercial establishments are using it but a city itself is not recycling it 100% that is not happening but i think a lot of new regulation which is coming in will force the cities to also have recycling of water but you are absolutely right there is no difference really if you can purify it properly it could really be doing and there is no problem about it at all so i think the black water the brown water whether because we always have polluted water which is the brown water i think it's an idea that we really need to purify it use the technologies that are available and use a very less energy to purify it 
if you can have a very energy efficient purification plants that would be highly useful so i think these are the ideas whose time has come and in fact the time for water is going away because the water is not available in the quantity that we need so we are no choice because he will be leaving us early if there are any questions you wish to address to suresh from the panelists or the audience please feel free oh uh, because he will be leaving us uh, early if you have any questions that you'd like to address to suresh uh, prabhu suresh uh, now whether my panelists or the audience uh, please feel free to do so please in English or in English or in Russian? In English, I suppose. I suppose. Um, so we know that uh, India has a very huge problem with uh, accumulated ecological damage in the rivers and uh, le uh, in the rivers and lakes. And uh, my question is, which role in the water policy and strategy of India uh, the rehabilitation of these lakes and rivers, uh, which role does it play in the current, uh, in the strategy of the, of the current government? Sorry, I didn't get a question. Which role the re rehabilitation of rivers of India? So you have to clean rivers because otherwise you cannot produce a clean water. You have to keep uh, the quality of the water in the rivers yeah, yeah. on a certain level. Sure, sure. Right. You know, and um, uh, this rehabilitation process, uh, I assume it shall be um, repeated or con constantly driven uh, over years and decades. And which role does it play in the current strategy of the Indian government concerning water pools? Sure. You know, you are absolutely right that uh, rivers are the main st mainstream of providing water to the people. And in fact, we have some very large rivers, but uh, many of them are very badly polluted. So the cause of pollution, as we call it, non-point pollution, if you don't address that properly, we are not able to go going to clean the rivers adequately. So we have a major program which is launched by the Prime Minister of India to clean our major rivers by first identifying the cause of pollution which comes into the river from the adjoining towns and cities. So we are actually trying to improve the governance of those cities and towns because industries keep polluting the river so we are trying to f make sure that there are effluent treatment plants for the, for the industries. Then the sewerage treatment plant which is the, one of the very important point that large sewers get into the rivers without being adequately treated. So we are making sure that there will be almost a zero emission on that count. Then the third source is in particularly some of the rivers, the people throw the dead bodies because that's the custom and tradition for years. So we are trying to put electric cremation so that people will not be able to throw their dead bodies into it. So it's a massive program and this program is already launched. We are involving large number of social organizations, non-governmental organizations into this. We are also involving a lot of religious leaders into this because the rivers in India are considered very revered. So rivers are revered. And because they are revered, there are a lot of cultural attachment to that issue. So we are trying to get them involved so that the sensitivities of no one is get hurt, but at the same time that their energy can be used for positive purposes. So we are working on that. Thank you, Suresh. You wanted to ask that. Please. Could you please uh, tell us uh, about uh, the water shortage in India, taking into account the demographic growth uh, in the country? How are you going to... How are you going to address the issue of water shortage in India uh, according to the tendency of uh, growth of the population in the country? Uh, I represent uh, water in Russia. Could you please uh, tell us uh, about uh, how you are going to address the issue of water shortage in India, taking into account the growth of population? Yeah.
unique situation in India that we have a east, east of India as well as in the northeast of India, we have always floods because there is so much of water available. Whereas there are other parts of the country, particularly in the south of India, where the droughts prevail quite a few times. So, in fact, if you look at the water availability, we have 4% of the fresh water of the world. And the per capita availability of water in the east of India is as high as 18,000 cubic meters. But it is so low, as low as 350 cubic meters in the south of India. So, one of the challenges we have is, how do you address the water scarcity in one part and too much of water causing floods in other parts of the world, uh, country. So we really need to address that. So one of the schemes that was thought about was could we have interbasin water transfer bringing only flood water, not all the water, only flood water during the time when it floods into the rivers which are not flooded. So that is something which is thought about. But otherwise, this is a major challenge for India is to deal with water shortage and floods at the same time of the year, causing huge damage year after year to property and to human life. Thank you, Suresh. Uh, I think we should move on now to uh, J. Carl Ganter. Great, thank you. Um, do we have a remote for the presentation? Yeah. Ah, terrific. All right, thanks, Dimitri. Appreciate that. Thank you. Wait for him to get that up there. Oops. Two seconds. Yeah, my picture. My pictures. Sorry, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about me. I run Circle of Blue. I'm a journalist and photographer, and we activate world-leading journalists, scientists, and data experts reporting on water issues around the world. Our whole mission is to get on the ground and find out what's happening and bridge. Uh, when we talk about smart treatment, we're talking about smart responses and actually understanding the problem. We need to know where we are before we are actually heading in a particular direction. So I'm a photographer and I have pictures to show, so hopefully he finds them quickly. Stand by, Dimitri has them, there we go, okay. Great, well, it's a great irony that we are on the water planet um, and that we're thirsty. And also that we face a massive, let's see, the remote works, here we go, um, massive global risk. The World Economic Forum publishes every year the Global Risks Report. I serve on the Global, water, or global Agenda Council on Water Security. And this year, water ranks number three. I don't know if that's good news or bad news. Um, we also got a major change in the, in the actual verbiage. We changed water crisis. An I, we changed it to an E, so we have crises. And so we have multiple crises in water around the world, so that's the bad news. And I'll show you some of the changes and some of the things that we're seeing on the ground very briefly. But we can't talk about water without realizing that about a seventh of the world's population doesn't have access to safe drinking water. We also can't talk about water without talking about the education side. When we talk about smart water treatments, well, when we bring water to people, we can make them smarter. Um, this young woman, four years old, carries water about six hours a day. In India, which is undergoing a massive transformation, that's why I think the questions will be, be, our focus on India will be intense in the coming years to see how India adjusts and adapts to the major challenges. These are women waiting to use the toilet. So when we talk about water and smart water treatments, we always have to talk about water, and we talk about clear water and black water. Wa clear water, drinking water, and wastewater. So we hear, when we talk about smart water responses, we hear that we are in an era of extreme data collection and exaggerating a bit here, total mass collaboration, okay? So you'll hear a little bit more about apps and, and high tech in a minute. Um, but around the world we have weak, sen weak signals and we have to understand what's missing. How do we connect these solutions with the great challenges? So we have these wonderful tools, we can listen better, we can tell really scary stories like how dry California is historically. We can also listen better and understand the interplays and the systemic connections when we're talking about smart water. We're talking about smart policy. This is a data dashboard, a live data dashboard of California's water supplies. This is, what, two days old. It updates every day, so I'm not sure why it didn't update today. But California is at 28% of its water supply. Think about that for a minute. Almost a quarter of its water supply of where it should be. 
So the world is just a click away. Smart, smart is just one click away. Or maybe not. So this is in Punjab, this is the Department of Irrigation. Um, this is big data. Hopefully it's big data in the past because the new government is pushing very hard to um, activate a new e-government. So all of this paper hopefully will be transferred. But it's very difficult to understand the solutions unless we understand where we are. Oh, let's see if this works here. Is the remote working? There we go. Okay. So when we also talk about smart water responses, we have to understand who the clients are. We have to understand who are the people at the other end. This is a family that I visited in Cartagena, Colombia. We were talking about water and wastewater treatment. How do you bring water to people? How do you bring wastewater treatment to people? Basically as simple as how do you bring a toilet? Well, this is the secret. This is the smart water response. So for every single engineer who's working on installing a sanitary system, wastewater treatment systems, there are two or three social workers because you can't just park a toilet in somebody's back room. They have to participate in building that toilet, in building the bathroom, in building the pipeline, in bringing the faucet to the home. They have to understand that process. There are behavioral changes necessary. And this is the most prized room in the house. In fact, it's the only room in the house. It's the toilet. So you can tell the level of pride and civic engagement. You also have to monitor and measure the value of water. Even in the poorest areas of Cartagena, there are water meters. So people actually understand the value of water. They pay a tiny bit for it. And a quick, a quick great solution story is in Manila. As I visited Cuatro, a very poor neighborhood in Manila, where they brought water to the community. And what happened? People went from paying 30% of their income, imagine 30% of your income going to water, to paying 3%. What happened when they had extra capital? You're very poor, you have no money. What happened? They started opening shops. The economic growth was amazing. These are the shops opening at 4.30 in the morning. Children had places to bathe, had fresh water to bathe, bathe with. And kids like Omar, who was a beggar, who had no water, his family had to spend most of their money to buy water, he now sells fish in the morning and goes to school. So again, the water dividend. And does water, does the unmeasured have value? When we don't measure water, this is a challenge in India, which India is, is addressing, but many farmers in India have free electricity, and so they let their pumps run for flood irrigation. So they are literally draining their aquifer unnecessarily. So when you don't measure, when we don't have smart water use and smart water treatment, we don't understand the value of water. There we go. So the last thing I want to say is when we're talking about technology, we're talking about smart water treatment, the first things we need to look at is we need to look at values, and we need to look at the va how we value water. How much is water worth? When we're talking about water and energy, water and food. How much is that input of water worth? And we also have to talk about governance. Do we have the regulatory structure and the incentives to drive the creativity and innovation? Finance, how do we finance infrastructure and make those investments possible? And then the talent, we have a major talent gap in the water sector. How do we activate the talent and educate? And then behavior, how do you train people again back to valuing water? And the last part here is big data. We're in an era of big data. How do we capture all this data so we can make informed decisions about which technology and which smart solutions to use? Where? Thank you, Carl. Our next speaker is Blake Burris, founder and chairman of Clean Web Initiative. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Carl. That was very enlightening and a nice segue into the discussion about clean web and activating entrepreneurs to use technology to solve all of these problems. Uh, I started this thing called, the, we had some slides, but I think they're more confusing than uh, what we need here for this panel. So um, I'll just talk for a few minutes about what we've been doing the last couple of years. We started a thing called the Clean Web Initiative uh, in 2013 with Facebook, the American Clean Skies Foundation, and a venture capitalist in California named Sunil Paul with the idea of, of taking technology um, or inspiring entrepreneurs to use technology to solve the biggest issues in uh, uh, addressing resource issues across waste, water, uh, transportation, and uh, energy. 
And there's actually direct correlation between energy and water. As uh, you see in Texas right now in the United States, the, uh, the energy companies are competing with the rice farmers over water. Uh, if you don't have water, you can't raise rice, but if you don't have water, you can't cool these coal-fired plants. So it's quite the battle, you know, what do you want, food or, food or uh, uh, electricity? Uh, frankly, um, you know, we've been traveling the world in uh, about 20 so countries, um, activating entrepreneurs and creating grassroots movements. Uh, we work across, um, kind of from the grassroots up through uh, companies, uh, NGOs, and, and local governments, as well as some of the national governments and some of the organizations in, in a variety of places, as well as venture capitalists like Terra Partners here, our partner on Clean Web in Israel. Um, but we haven't had a lot of attention in the, uh, the water space, and I think that's maybe because of the lack of knowledge of, of water. We all use water, and, and uh, most of us pay for it, I guess not in a lot, not other parts of the world, but uh, most of it's metered and we use it. Uh, but there hasn't been a lot of innovators attracted to the water space, and I think that's because the, there's not been a lot of awareness around you know, the real challenges of water. Even when you live in Las Vegas, you know, the AC is blowing cold in the casinos, and when you open your tap, uh, there's water there. When you flush the toilet, it works. Um, but it, some work that, uh, like, the, like the work that Carl's doing to bring attention to uh, the real problems facing us in the water space, I think people are starting to wake up to it. And we're, we're in the business of waking up entrepreneurs to the opportunity associated with that problem. You know, it's, it's kind of uh, mind-numbing a lot of times to hear how bad the problem is. It's like watching uh, Al Gore's movie about climate change. People leave the, uh, the theater and they get in their big car and they go fill up the gas tank and they, they kind of forget about it because it doesn't seem like they can do much about it. But in our world of uh, the entrepreneurs and the, the technology-minded people, we point to those big problems and say there's also a huge opportunity here to make money. And that's what inspires a lot of people in the Western world. Uh, um, and increasingly through the, the spread of the Silicon Valley spirit around the world. Every city I travel to, we, seem to say, we see the same thing happening. We see innovation hubs, we see Google campus in Tel Aviv, and we see hundreds of, upon hundreds of entrepreneurs. We did a hackathon in, in uh, Tel Aviv last November with Terra and Dev for Israel, where we had developers assembled over a weekend about 250, I think, maybe 350 registered, 250 developers building solutions for the developing world. And these aren't necessarily uh, environmentalists. They're merely, you know, intelligent, uh, talented individuals that are looking to build companies that can scale and create uh, economic and environmental impact. So that's a bit about what we've been doing with the clean web. Uh, we have activity in, like I said, about 20 countries. Um, in other sectors like transportation, we're uh, activating entrepreneurs in cities like Moscow. We just had a meetup last night. And the same could happen in water, to where you have people getting together in dialogue, much like this big conference where there are thousands and thousands of people. But imagine dozens of people getting together in a, even a pub or a local uh, meetup space, uh, co-working space, and talking about these challenges in, in ways they might address them with creative solutions. And more to the point, uh, not, not necessarily big company solutions, but apps that can actually create impact. I like to use the example of Waze, which is also an Israeli, I'm giving all this Israeli praise here, but... Uh, <laughs> But not a terror company, you wish it were, uh, but Waze, the travel application, you know, it's an app that works on your smartphone and it helps you get from point A to point B. But the big data that results from millions and millions of people using this app creates uh, valuable solutions and data sets for municipal governments so they can better plan. We'd love to see the same thing happen in water where people are using their smartphone to monitor, say, creek conditions, you know, the, how much water might be flowing in a stream or the fact that that stream is dried up. And the governments may not have capacity to monitor these sorts of things, but that data source can flow back to online portals that can be accessible to uh, uh, programmers, software developers, that then create apps. Uh, same is happening in air quality measurement, where companies are creating mobile solutions that uh, provide value to consumers, and then uh, other uh, data sets that may be interesting to regional health authorities or local health authorities. And this is really part of something bigger we like to call uh, this, whole, this whole idea of smart-ups. Instead of just creating startups that are here to make money and sell, you know, dreaming of selling to Google or Facebook or Apple, uh, we like to think of smart-ups, this, this, new, this new term we're coining, and about to release a, uh, a manifesto called the Smart-Up Manifesto, meant to inspire a new wave of entrepreneurs that are creating solutions across the key sectors to address the biggest problems facing cities around the world. So be more on that published uh, very soon. But if you follow the Clean Web hashtag or look at Smart Ups on Twitter, you'll be able to find some more information. That's all. Thank you, Blake. Uh, if I might remind our speakers, uh, on behalf of our simultaneous uh, translators, 
uh, to talk speak a little bit uh, slowly makes life nicer uh, for those people. Uh, I'd like to turn now to uh, Felix Karmazinov, Director General of Vodokanal of St. Petersburg. <clears throat> Distinguished guests, I'm the head uh, of uh, Voda Canal St. Petersburg. It's an organization that supplies uh, water to the whole city of St. Petersburg. When we speak about uh, the challenges of today and the problems of today, what challenges we face, um, I would like to make uh, a step back. Uh, let's go 25 years back. Uh, 25 years ago, St. Petersburg uh, used uh, 3.5 million cubic meters of water and uh, cleaned uh, about 50% of wastewater and the quality of uh, uh, wastewater and the quality of drink water left much to be desired. So 25 years ago, we had a huge challenge to change dramatically the situation and to construct the system of water supply and water recycling. What did we manage to do? Here on the slide, you can see the amount of water that people need to produce this or that product. I'm not going to tell you in detail uh, all these uh, figures, you can see them on the slides, but what we managed to do um, recently and what water supply in St. Petersburg looks like now. In the past, uh, we supplied 3.5 uh, uh, million cubic meters of water, and the quality of water was uh, quite low, and there were claims about water supply in the city. Nowadays, uh, we supply 1,700,000 cubic meters of water every day, so the water consumption was uh, uh, decreased by two times, and we managed to dramatically increase the quality of water. The consumption of uh, water nowadays uh, is uh, not only complies not only to Russian standards but also to the WHO. The same thing uh, happened with the wastewater. Nowadays uh, we treat not only 50% of wastewater as in the past, uh, today we treat 98.4% uh, of all the wastewater of St. Petersburg. And I should tell you that the quality of uh, treatment uh, complies with the European standards uh, and uh, all the claims uh, of the countries of the Baltic Sea uh, are no longer in place. But it doesn't mean that we managed to um, address all the issues. Uh, one of the main issues uh, that uh, we managed to address uh, is uh, optimization of water consumption per capita. Twenty years ago, we used uh, 350 liters of water per 24 hours. Uh, and uh, nowadays, according to the results and figures of 2014, the consumption will be decreased by uh, two 142 liters per capita. And I think it's not the limit. Uh, we haven't reached the total optimization of water consumption. Within five or six years, uh, we will have uh, to address this issue and we will have uh, to achieve um, the following uh, uh, indicator, 110, 115 liters per capita per 24 hours. Moreover, today uh, we pay much uh, attention to new challenges that we face. Unfortunately, civilization not only solves um, the problems, but also creates new problems. What are the new challenges uh, that uh, raise uh, concerns uh, among us in the region of the Baltic Sea? First of all, significant uh, amount uh, of uh, toxins uh, that uh, 
come uh, into water together with medis medicals. And uh, nowadays uh, we face uh, several problems uh, that we face and try to solve. Diclefenac, uh, the amount of this uh, chemical uh, grows uh, from one year to another. And uh, I cannot say that uh, it is uh, very dangerous for us, but nevertheless, we have to address this issue now. And this is what we do. Within uh, the next years, uh, this uh, uh, problem may uh, become more dangerous to us, and we will have to pay much attention to it. Ethinyl estradiol is uh, also uh, one of the um, products we get from the uh, medicine, and uh, this is the kind uh, of uh, product uh, that uh, is dangerous uh, for people. So our researchers, scholars, and uh, we try to find a solution to this uh, problem. Together with the decrease of water consumption per capita, which is uh, one of the main issues of concern nowadays, uh, we have to think uh, about the hazards uh, of uh, today and the hazards that may appear in the future, especially for people who live in the region of the Baltic Sea. And uh, the last but not the least problem is uh, microplastics. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, unfortunately, several years ago, we didn't speak about uh, such a thing, but nowadays, uh, it's uh, quite a dangerous thing for us. The resources of microplastics are everywhere, all around us. Uh, so our efforts today are aimed uh, at uh, uh, modernization of water treatment uh, in order to uh, address uh, the issue of microplastics. And uh, the last issue I wanted to draw your attention to is uh, viruses um, and contamination, whether we want it or not. But the humankind uh, faces uh, more and more viruses every year. They are carriers of huge danger for people. And nowadays, in order to combat viruses, we have only three uh, methods. Ozone treatment, uh, dioxide of chlorine, and ultraviolet. And I think uh, that uh, researchers, uh, scholars, uh, those uh, who are active in the sphere of nanotechnology should uh, address the issue of water decontamination. They should find uh, new non-traditional methods of water treatment that will allow us to address the dangers uh, and uh, concerns. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Saint Petersburg, um, in, in St. Petersburg, all the drink water is treated with ultraviolet. Violet. And uh, the problem of uh, virus contamination uh, has uh, decreased uh, to the lowest level in our city. That was all I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Felix. I just ask one small question. Perhaps you said it and I missed it, but roughly what percentage of St. Petersburg's municipal freshwater supply is from recycling? St. Petersburg is a lucky city. St. Petersburg uh, is located on the banks of the Neva River, and the Neva River brings 2,500 cubic meters of water every second. Just uh, imagine one second, uh, and uh, uh, in front of you, two. 1,500 uh, cubic meters. So there is uh, not an issue of using recycled water. Thank you, Felix. Uh, our next speaker is Andrei Kobzyev, co-founder and chief executive officer of Aquifer Company. Can you hear me? Hello. We talked a lot about world issues and water treatment, but shall we concentrate on smart technologies? 
there's something uh, I want you to show that you've probably already heard, but let's start from uh, the slide number one. The problem of fresh water all over the planet is aggravated by the simple fact uh, of urbanization. We have more people living in towns now, and uh, consequently they consume more water. Which brings us to the simple idea. Sorry, this is my first presentation as a panelist. And we pollute water. We, we contam contamine water, that contaminate water. That's why we should treat it. As far as the principal sources of pollution are concerned, we separate water in two types, surface water and underground water. With underground water, the question is more or less solved because depending on the horizon, the, the composition is more or less the same. But when we're talking about surface water, the quality of water will not be the same in different regions. You have agricultural region, mining regions, and so on and so forth. What I want to say, depending on the type of the industry that you have on the territory, you will have different contamination composition in the water. And so we did. What are the main treatment possibilities? This is not a unique process. We should separate this process in three uh, stages. First, to the, first of all, I'm talking about deferrization or elimination of iron. Then we go through decomination and then about the desalting of water. Each of these three phases are separated in uh, different and precise technologies. If we're talking about fresh water, drinking water, the humankind has, ha has faced this problem in 19th century. And we had uh, only one solution, to use chlorine for decontamination of water. Then we saw the development of technologies. And nowadays, we have different modern ways of uh, water treatment, like a large, uh, large radical UV treatment, chlorine dioxide, and mixed methods of water treatment using different technologies. We can use ultrasound, ionization, and so on and so forth. Basically, every technology has uh, its efficiency, but we have no unique solution for every case. I don't really see that uh, we have one size fits all solution. As far as water treatment uh, is concerned, we should eliminate biological substances, viruses, and so on and so forth. At the same time, the technology should be cheap and user friendly. And as far as I understand, there is no solution corresponding to every criteria. I mean, user-friendly, cheap, and efficient. I want to say that we should continue research in this, uh, in this field. If you want my opinion, in order to be successful in water treatment, we should use combined methods, use existing experience, and try to choose among them. 
on the simplicity basis and on the cost efficiency basis. We should not forget about energy efficiency and about the possibility to apply this solution into water treatment in the cities. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Our next speaker is Oran Kochavi, director of Terra Venture Partners. So first, thanks for inviting me to participate in the panel and uh, to my colleagues and crowd. Uh, as anyone that was sitting in the panel today, I will take a really different angle from uh, what uh, the others do. What? Closer. Closer. Okay. So uh, Terra Venture Partners is a venture capital, of course. So we look at water as uh, some kind of a business. And, and as my colleagues said before, we also uh, work with uh, the Clean Web Initiative. So we support uh, IT and software companies that uh, help to uh, reduce the consumption of water and etc. But uh, that's not the deal today. So. Basically, uh, Israel is a very uh, young country, only 66 years old, and when my uh, grandparents uh, came to Israel uh, from Europe, it was basically a desert. So water was a necessity of life. Uh, we had to create water from I don't know where and uh, in order to drink something. Uh, maybe that's one of the reasons that uh, Israel had become a true leader in uh, water technologies. And uh, in the last, uh, I don't know, maybe 40 years, uh, irrigation systems, uh, Israeli irrigation systems are uh, being sold worldwide, also in uh, China and in uh, India. And a lot of different places. Also, uh, Israel uh, ranked uh, number one in uh, deciliation systems and uh, research. Uh, a lot of research has been done, but uh, because of uh, some government issues in Israel, not a lot of deciliation uh, uh, systems are installed currently in Israel, but we're getting close to a point that uh, we can uh, definitely uh, get all our water, the distillated water. So. Another thing uh, that, uh, uh, that Israel had become uh, uh, innovative in the field of water is uh, because the government truly supports innovation. So it's not uh, uh, just a buzzword that Israel is a startup nation. It happened because, uh, uh, because of the Israeli entrepreneur and because uh, the entrepreneurs get a really good environment and really good ecosystem in order uh, uh, to create their ventures in nice atmosphere. So Terra Venture Partners is a government supported venture capital uh, some uh, if there are uh, Russians in the crowd so it uh, similar to Moscow seed fund when uh, here the government participate uh, uh, in the investments but we have tons of different uh, uh, governmental problems, most of them from the uh, Ministry of Economy, Chief Scientist Office, and I will elaborate a little bit more about how the model is working, and I will give two uh, uh, examples of companies that we invested in. I will make it very quick. So. Terra is a multi-stage fund, but uh, basically we run a government-backed incubator and we make positive impact investments. So it's not only about clean tech, it's food and water technologies, medical, education, transportation, whatever can create positive impact. Uh, and uh, we will not invest in uh, marketing technologies, uh, uh, etc., gaming. So uh, the... Uh, the government support uh, is granted by a very, very competitive, uh, it's a competition, it's a tender, and we have to participate. We are one of the only uh, owners of 100% of the incubator, and we won the tender because of the experience of the uh, general partners of Terra, which is one of the, uh, is a chemi uh, chemistry uh, PhD, and one holds a, a physics PhD. So. Uh, when we invest in a company, we have a 6 to 1 matching from the government. Uh, what's, what's not written in the presentation is that we must invest in innovation and not in incremental improvements. So we mitigate a risk, but take mo uh, so we take money from the government, but we have to invest in 
companies that are so innovative. We see ideas that are so out of the box. We take a very big risk, but we, uh, uh, but we leverage our investors' money in order to create ideas that will change the world completely. Uh, basically, we invest in dream. Okay, just in a presentation or in a little bit of a research or something like that. Of course, we are looking for a perfect team, some uh, perfect, uh, well-experienced entrepreneurs that can uh, uh, make their dream come true. But I think the leverage is, uh, uh, is uh, helping us and the entrepreneurs, of course. So this uh, explains, uh, I think, uh, really nice how, uh, how the model works. We invest 100K in a company, the government, the Ministry of Economy, 600K, and uh, we take all the equity. So you must understand this is a pretty good deal for a venture capitalist. But uh, uh, if the company exits eventually, they have to pay back for the office of the chief scientist, but they don't really care on the case of exit. What also uh, is not mentioned in the, uh, in the presentation is that the R&D center must stay in Israel. Okay, So this is another way for the government to empower innovation inside Israel. You must keep the IP, you must keep the R&D center in Israel, and all, if the company exits, then she pays back the loan. So this is what we do. Uh, we invest in maybe seven companies per year. Not only, not all of them about water, but there are other incubators in Israel, and all of them, most of them are about clean tech, water technologies, food tech, etc. So we invest in seven companies a year, and after a year and a half or two years of incubation, that basically uh, we pay. We invested in a company only 100k, so the uh, the cost of the money was very low. We decide after a year and a half of due diligence active due diligence. They sit together with us in the incubator. We help them to make the connections with the industry, with all the industry leaders of, uh, uh, of water. It's called Mekorot in Israel and other uh, companies. Uh, we decide if we want to follow up the investments. We, uh, we manage currently $50 million under management. It's not uh, such of a big uh, uh, venture capital, but we are a boutique venture capital, and we choose our, uh, our investments wisely. So we follow on the investment, and in a lifetime of a company, we can invest around uh, $3 million. After that, we'll need uh, some people to join us. So uh, this is the incubator. I don't know if you can see in the pictures, but it's a thousand uh, square meter facility. It's located in the north of Israel. It's a really nice place and uh, connected to the nature. So all the walls are made from mud and we have uh, streaming water and a uh, really interesting place. These are the founders. It's less interesting. And these are the, <laughs> no, it's not relevant for the presentation. And this is the, uh, uh, this is the areas that we invest in. Of course, you can see of the, the clean web and the ID sector, and we really encourage uh, uh, the ecosystem in Israel to start uh, uh, develop a clean web application, and as, as Blake said, smart apps. I really like the idea of, uh, of uh, yeah, smart apps. So. Uh, Israel startup nation, you must know it, um, maybe 5,000 startups right now, and, uh, but let's talk about the two companies that, uh, that are currently in our portfolio. So Fabus Energy uh, is one to be one of the 100 most innovative clean tech, global clean tech index, and uh, it's a water heating system for hotels and uh, hospitals, etc. currently working in 80 locations in Israel in, uh, in a very big uh, uh, hotels like Ramada or Holiday Inn, Marriott and Crown Plaza, stuff like that. So uh, basically it, uh, uh, with uh, an algorithm that calculates and measures when it's the best time to use solar power, electric power, and the special water pumps that are, uh, of course, uh, patent protected, it uh, managed to reduce 65% of the energy cons uh, consumption and 80% of the, of the pollution. So, of course, this is also helped to reduce the, uh, uh, the water consumption and a smart up. It's uh, actually a, an innovative and a disruptive uh, faucet because the, the, the tap that we know today haven't been changed maybe for the 150 years, I don't know. But uh, 
there are several applications. Uh, applications here so you can uh, uh, decide how much uh, liters of water uh, you want uh, swimming in one minute. You can uh, higher lower the pressure so you can create uh, for, for example, in a, in a hotel, uh, uh, the the consumer can feel like he's uh, in a regular bus, but you lower the, uh, the you lower the liters per minute, and you hide the the higher the pressure, so it feels regular. Also. There's a special system, so when in the minute you press on the button, you wait for two seconds, and it starts immediately the water uh, in the in the heat that you'd like, that uh, that you wanted them to be. So there's no waste of water uh, from the minute uh, the water are coming from the uh, from the heat water heater to your tap. So. I will elaborate more uh, if you want. I'm really actively on uh, LinkedIn and Facebook, so you can add me and we can continue the discussion. I'd love to. And uh, thank you very much. You are my details, and you're welcome to contact me, and thanks. Thank you, Oren. <laughs> that finishes our six uh, panelists, but we have two expert Respondents, and I'd like to call on Arnaud Brun, founder and CEO of Tenavia, for his comments. So, it's okay. So, thank you very much. Uh, I'm uh, Arnaud Brun. Uh, I'm the founder and the CEO of uh, Tenevia Company. So, what is Tenevia? It's okay? Uh, the microphone is okay? Yeah? So, so um, what is Tenevia? Tenevia is a young company, French young company, which developed uh, software, innovating software, by f uh, innovating software of image analysis, picture analysis to provide environmental data by a video camera. So Alexander, uh, can we show us a little film, please? So our first solution, our first application was developed for the river me measurement and river monitoring. So its name is uh, Tenevia Riverboard. And as you can see on the film, as you can see on the movie, uh, the goal is to use the video camera, and when we receive the pictures, we can detect automatically the water level, the water speed, and the discharge of the river, only with the image. So why developed, uh, uh, we have developed this solution? This solution was developed for, mainly for the flood warnings, to protect population when we are a big event like uh, inundations. Today, to measure this information, to, to have this information, you have to uh, use electronic captors, electronic sensors, and it's very, very um, poor information in case of emergency. So with this solution, we can provide a very easily information, a very safety information, even in the extreme discharge, even in the extreme event. And the second ace of this technology is to provide a, a good information for hydroelectricity optimization. It's very important in uh, these topics in France because um, uh, it's uh, uh, a very um, uh, we have very many, many actors on our hydroelectricity markets, and the price is very low. So if you can optimize your water reservoir, your water uh, production, you can provide at the company which uh, produce hydroelectricity more and more benefits. So it's a very first application, concrete application, uh, and we have developed uh, on this way many other applications. The first one is to detect the snow cover in the mountain and to provide the water quantity information at the company which produces hydroelectricity, for example. 
A second one is developed. To, a third one is developed to um, detect the cloud cover and to identify and to forecast the um, snow cover for the production of um, photovoltaic park. And how goes it uh, with this solution? Is to provide a new technology, a new approach of environmental data by using softwares and image analysis. So, thank you. It's very short, but... Uh, <laughs> that's good, that's good. Thank you, Arno. Uh, turn now to our uh, other expert, Olivier Conan of 100 Innovations. Hi. Do you hear me? Yes. So um, I'm going to present you the, um, our project. Uh, it's called uh, Econo Project. Um, we created the Econo company since two years now. Uh, this company, um, the target is to find solution how to save water in uh, everyday uh, use, in for everyday uh, household needs. Um, so, for example, do you know when you wash your hands? 80% of the water directly goes to the sink without touching your hands. Why? Just because your hands are not free, your hands are busy, and you can't easily the, cut the, the water flow. Um, so our, our first product, our first solution, is already on the market and is called uh, Start and Flow. Uh, this is an ergonomic way to use a faucet in uh, kitchen equipments and in bathrooms. Um, so maybe we can uh, show the, the, the some pictures. So we, we have invented a special um, ergonomy uh, to use a faucet without the, the, the end. Um, we, we just add sensors on the front panel and the, of the furniture. Um, our system is very simple. You can add it on in any kind of furniture, any kind of uh, faucet. Even if you are doors or drawers under your sink, our special, special specific sensors uh, transform all the front panel, meaning draw, doors or drawers, into uh, sensitive panels. All the front panel of the furniture become sensitive, and you can uh, simply um, uh, adjust. Uh, you can simply cut, uh, switch on or off the water flow simply with your knee. Um, maybe we can see another picture. Oh yes. Okay, so now you can see an example uh, on a kitchen. So you always have your knee uh, two centimeters from the front panel of the furniture. So it's really an ergonomic way to 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 reduce uh, water wastes. Uh, it's also really um, easy to use and um, intuitive system. Doesn't work. Sorry. Um, oh yes, now you can see how the system is inside your furniture. So um, the, 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 this furniture is a simple, the standard furniture from any uh, uh, customers. We only had two solenoid valves, uh, one on the hot water, one on the cold water, and the system um, analyzes the vibrations in the doors or drawers and knows if it's a voluntary touch or if it's a false information such as uh, door slams. Um, finally, the system is very low power consumption. Um, we still need batteries or power adapters, but uh, for example on a battery, uh, four batteries, uh, can, you can use it during uh, three years. Um, so this is the first solution for uh, bathrooms um, and uh, kitchen faucets. Uh, we also are working on other solutions uh, for showers, uh, uh, etc. Um, so, our first product is already uh, sale in uh, France uh, for professionals. 
such as plumbers, uh, kitchen designers, etc. Uh, this second product uh, called WeFlow is specifically designed for do-it-yourself market, which is a huge market for us uh, and uh, our pr principal target for next year. Uh, the produce is conceived in France, uh, I'm from France, uh, and uh, conceived in France and produced in France. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Olivier. That finishes our formal presentations. One thing you can see right away uh, is that uh, water problems are defined uh, in very, very different ways depending upon where you are. If you're in a city, if you're in Western Europe or in a Leningrad, you, you face one set of problems and you address them with uh, a particular a set of solutions. Uh, but if you're in South Asia, in India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, or in many parts of the Middle East where I live, uh, or in Africa, the problems are vastly different and the solutions to them would have to be different as well. Where I am in Qatar, uh, there are no rivers, it's a tiny country, uh, there's only a very small aquifer. The country is currently investing billions of dollars in construction of underground reservoirs, freshwater reservoirs, they have to be underground because of the terrific heat uh, that would uh, lead to evaporation uh, of most of the water. Even when they're finished with this, they will probably only have uh, a, a fresh water supply on hand for perhaps two months or three months uh, of the year. They rely, of course, uh, enormously, uh, probably 98%, on desalination of water and increasingly are uh, recycling used water uh, for watering trees, public gardens, uh, and lawns, and so forth. So extremely different uh, uh, circumstances. So I'd like to call upon the uh, audience or any member of the panel uh, if you have observations or questions that you'd like to address, uh, please do so now. Yes, sir. I will try to speak in Russian. I'm from Tunisia. And I, I agree with Mr. Roberts. The problems are completely different. I'm originated from Northern Africa. I'm from Tunisia. We have completely different problems. We don't have fresh water at all. This is the main issue. Knowing that we have sea, the first thing for us is desalination. You, you can understand. And the technology that we have is not cost efficient. It's too expensive. That's why the main issue for us and the main option for us is a cheap water treatment technology in order to... Thank you for, thank you for the discussion at a whole. Thank you uh, for, for that uh, testifying to the tremendous differences that we uh, find in the world. Other, please. I... I'm a farmer from Punjab, and I saw his slides, and it reminds me of back home. And uh, the problem is, farmers never used water as they use now, 20 years ago. It's the political decision making that incentivizes farmers to misuse water. And rather than say it's an issue of the farming community, I think so. It's an issue of political governance, and that it, it, it's, a, it's a problem and as you rightly pointed out and as a farmers organization this is what we keep saying is still you don't tell farmers how to measure water because right now farmers measuring water in numbers of hours that free electricity comes to him he needs to be able to measure it in liters of how much each crop requires per day thank you just an observation that is perfectly right thank you 
over, over here. Dimitri. Thank you. Thank you. I have just two comments and one question. The first comment, uh, I'm a director of Techno Park from the city of Hantemansisk in Siberia. I have visited the uh, Voda Canal of St. Petersburg. It's a great facility. And back in Soviet Union times, um, there was a project uh, to change uh, Siberian uh, uh, rivers uh, to the south. So if you have shortage of water, we can change the beds uh, of the Siberian rivers and bring the water to you. I'm just kidding of course. And the second comment, we had a startup at our techno park uh, aimed uh, at uh, oil uh, extraction. But that innovator uh, left uh, and uh, I asked him why did he left and he said that uh, it was more profitable to uh, buy two sources uh, of uh, mineral water in Gruzia and he decided to make Georgia. So he decided uh, that it was more uh, cost efficient uh, to make business uh, in uh, water tr than in oil. How much uh, does uh, one cubic meter of drink water cost? Uh, and uh, perhaps then we will understand uh, where the uh, technology is most cost efficient. So how much does a cubic meter of water cost in St. Petersburg, in Israel, and Qatar? So I can answer your question. Do you want an answer in rubles? 21 rubles, 21 rubble. So half a dollar, yes, half a dollar. And how much does uh, one cubic meter of water in Qatar cost? How much does... Uh, uh, it would be a lot. You, you pay yeah. for water or free, yeah. water free for you? Uh, at the moment, it's completely free. It's a very, very wealthy country. The per capita income is the highest in the world, just for Qataris, who only number about 275,000 uh, in the country. It approaches a half million. However, they are increasingly concerned about the water circumstances uh, that they face. And so some months ago, they installed a water meter on my home. It hasn't been activated yet. I don't think it's been installed on Qatari homes. This is one pampered population, and of course it's a part of the ruling bargain. Uh, the people are beneficiaries of uh, tremendous wealth in an absolute monarchy with no thought given uh, to introduction of democracy. So I'm one, uh, I think the expatriates are soon going to have to pay for their water. My guess is it will be extremely uh, cheap, uh, at least uh, initially. Yeah. And in Israel? <coughs> the question is to product the water or for the consumer? Consumer. To the consumer it costs uh, two and a half dollars. Two, two, two and, and a half dollars for one cubic water. Uh, in Hantemansisk the price is one dollar per cubic meter. Why is Moza in St. Petersburg? Thank you. I wanted to pick up, too, on the point about wastewater treatment, and I think that's where we're at, wastewater treatment. I think that's where we're going to see a lot of innovation, and we already are in Singapore talking about new water. That's the name, in fact, when you mentioned the comedian. In Singapore, one of the first things when you work in water, everybody wants to show you their water treatment plant. So you're a mini celebrity because you're interested. And then they give you a bottle of water, and it says new water. Everybody knows about it, right? So in Las Vegas, they need new water because the price is so expensive. They're spending almost a billion dollars, that's with a B, for a new pipeline to go underneath Lake Mead. The pipeline's almost complete. That's just for insurance if Lake Mead drops about another 100 feet, okay? So with wastewater, it's, we're calling it, it's the wrong term. It shouldn't be called wastewater. It's a, it's a resource. And it's, in most cases, easier to clean wastewater than it is to desal. And also, there are new technologies, so it's actually a closed loop feedback, so that the energy, the waste in the wastewater is actually energy. So there is technology that will advance that we're seeing more of. So the Yamuna River in India 
isn't just a black, isn't just black water. It bubbles with methane. That methane, that energy can be captured to actually run the wastewater treatment plant. You know, 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by seawater, and so uh, a great many people feel that's the, an obvious solution uh, wherever you are in the world is uh, desalination. I wonder if we could uh, consider that for a moment, your thoughts about desalination. There are some people who feel that its impact on the marine environment over time uh, could be quite severe. I think there are over 20,000 desalination plants on the planet. There's a concentration of them, of course, in the Middle East, particularly in the Gulf area, where the uh, oil and gas industries are huge and profitable and where they can afford to build multi-billion dollar desalination plants. But I'm wondering what your own thinking is about the, you know, the future of desalination uh, uh, and possible technological innovations in that industry that might make its impact on the marine environment less threatening than it may now be. I can jump in on that too. Please. In, uh, in Doha, um, I visited the, the desal plants. Um, again, come see our desal plants. So my itinerary always is interesting. Um, the desal plant there has massive pipelines of natural gas that go in. So desal is very, very energy intensive. And you have to remember the picture I showed in India. So the equation there, that's an energy and water picture, okay? So when, and it's an ag picture too. 70, depending on where you are, but let's just say 70% of the world's water, fresh water that's consumed is used for agriculture, right? So we will never most likely get down to the price for desal water to actually grow our food. They tried in Doha, they tried in Qatar, but it's just too expensive. And currently, at, right now, until they finish their reservoirs, Doha has about 1.8 days of water security. So if a desal plant fails, and remember, desal plants are complicated, lots of valves, lots of pipes, lots of wires, lots of electronics, they're on the grid, they're smart systems, smart systems can fail. So they're not resilient. So the real innovation I think we're seeing here too is valuing ecosystems. How do we preserve our water through wetlands and naturally treat it? We're also seeing, again, back to valuing water. This is one of the things that we're working on at, at the Economic Forum and our Agenda Council. Really the two or the three things. One is values. How do you price water and how do you value water? Two is governance, exactly correct. How do you have the governmental structure both locally and nationally to actually put the regulatory processes into place so you value water. The other part, too, is how do you build the financial structure to invest in municipal systems? In the United States, we have a decaying municipal system, yet we also have, many would say, a decaying governmental system in, or at least communication system in Washington. It's very difficult to get money to fix our municipal systems on the Great Lakes, in fact, which hold 20% of the world's uh, surface water. Thank you. We have two questions, or oh, three, I see. The gentleman in the second row first, please. Can you hear me well? Two weeks ago, the Economist uh, magazine from Great Britain uh, made an article about uh, Chinese uh, uh, water supply problems. Uh, Chinese people want to construct a new grand channel and uh, to bring water to the north uh, of the country. And the Economist magazine has stated that the major issue of China is uh, um, that uh, the policy is uh, not reliable because uh, they do not pay anything for water. And I think that the water is a global resource. So uh, we have uh, to develop responsible policies and strategies. And unfortunately, in uh, many regions of Russia, we face the same problem. The, it's not cost efficient to make water, but the Chinese uh, example is a good one. Unfortunately, we have uh, 
a strange uh, uh, situation in the world. Uh, the China uh, have uh, the industrial facilities with large water consumption levels, uh, uh, and uh, they uh, grow rice uh, um, where they also use a lot of water, so they can actually produce other things. Uh, and we also forget about WTO that uh, speaks about dampings and subsidies. So we raise a question uh, of unfair competition on the global level. Uh, I don't know to whom should I address this uh, question, but uh, I think that on the international arena, the United Nations uh, and other international organizations uh, should force uh, the governments to pay for water, because they, we should not forget about the value of water. It's a huge uh, issue for many countries, India, China, Latin America, and Russia, too. Thank you. If you want to make any comments, please do not hesitate. <laughs> please, I can do two seconds on that. Well, one, the China Challenge, the South North Water Transfer Project, we did the original pro reporting on that. So we were the first to actually go underneath the Yellow River. Um, the reason that China is moving so much water north, of course, it's wet in the south, it's, it's dry in the north, but what's also in the north is China's coal supply. So China is moving the water north, not only for Beijing, but to mine and process coal. So that gets us back to this nexus between water, food, and energy. So when it comes down to there's a lot of discussion at the UN, there's also discussion at, w, at the WTO, the World Economic Forum, and others, again, back to valuing water. Do we put a price on water? Who owns water? The human right to water. This is the big story of the century. It's really complicated, and I think you bring up a, a great point. I, I can't answer how China and Russia will, will manage that. that. But it, it's, it is all about water footprint as well. How much water does it take to produce a product? And is that water in a closed loop or is it consumed or processed? Uh, thank you. The gentleman in the rear, please. Uh, thank you very much. I would like uh, to come back to the previous uh, question of desalination and the production of fresh water from seawater. There was a question uh, uh, about uh, the new innovations and technologies uh, for the future. Of course, uh, the future, in the future, we have uh, to produce uh, fresh water from seawater because 70% of our planet is covered with seawater. The methods uh, for the future should be efficient uh, in terms of uh, water desalination. Um, shall we come back uh, to the electric and chemical methods? Uh, we raise here a question of uh, synergy. We need, again, energy to desalinate water. And again, the question is uh, where to take the energy from for such uh, methods of uh, desalination. So there is uh, a double double question. The solar energy, we can use solar energy for the uh, production of fresh water. So what plans uh, do you have uh, for the future in the Middle East, in the north of Africa? Any technologies uh, for the future to use uh, solar energy for the production of fresh water? Uh, that was what I wanted to say about uh, desalination and the production of fresh water. Once again, thank you for your great presentations. Quickly, uh, the, I've, I've been told that as much as 20% of the revenue that Saudi Arabia derives from its oil uh, sales goes into the uh, running of its very extensive desalination plants. It is experimenting now very extensively with solar uh, panels uh, to, to do this, uh, and, and that may bring a terrific uh, relief. But we have at least one question here, please. Yeah. My name is uh, Alex Say, and I represent uh, Kuramat's uh, startup from Luxembourg. I would like to continue the discussion and your comment uh, uh, to uh, Mr. Karamzin about uh, tariffs uh, on water. I'm uh, very much convinced uh, that uh, uh, 
there is no, no correlation between uh, innovations uh, and the price of one cubic meter of water. One example from Germany. Uh, in uh, Germany, water costs uh, really a lot. In France, too, we have our colleagues from France here, and uh, France is a huge uh, market. The tariffs are very high there, but it's very complicated for startups to enter the market. There are several leaders in the market that control the situation there. So if we speak about the innovative technologies, uh, we should uh, speak about the channels on how technologies can enter the market and reach the final consumer. If uh, they, uh, there are research and development institutions, if there is uh, an awareness among civil society about the value of water, then uh, they, uh, they know that uh, the entrepreneurs are allowed uh, to make a mistake when they produce something. We should uh, uh, go away from uh, Soviet, uh, um, Soviet uh, opinion. Uh, a question uh, to the market, uh, whether the market uh, is uh, tolerant uh, enough to accept uh, the new products. Uh, for example, a new product uh, can be really great, but only in two years. And then there's a question to society, whether society is tolerant enough uh, for entrepreneurs uh, and uh, entrepreneurship activity. Such an area as uh, water is needed uh, to develop water sector in the country. We need such a culture, such an awareness uh, among civil society. A person, let's take, uh, for example, such a situation, uh, a, a person just invented uh, a new water treatment. He is not a chemical engineer or a physical engineer, but uh, in such a case, in such uh, countries as uh, Germany or France, people do not want to use such discoveries, uh, and uh, the prices for water are really high there. 4.5 euro um, is the tariff of uh, for cubic meter of water. It's uh, an equivalent. It's about uh, six uh, dollars. So I have a question. Uh, you showed us uh, the tendencies and the priorities uh, uh, for the development of uh, water supply systems and uh, decrease of water consumption. You showed us uh, three main uh, vectors, uh, three main issues that we should uh, address, uh, that we should uh, fight against viruses, for example. My question is, do you think uh, that uh, Russian economy Let's say Russian technological companies in water supply sector can be um, enough uh, competitive uh, with the with such tariffs as we have nowadays and with such level of water consumption per capita. Uh, frankly speaking, uh, just tell you my thoughts. Uh, Russia has a unique expertise uh, and, uh, in terms of uh, work with huge masses of water. On the one hand, we consume a lot. On the other hand, uh, uh, there are a lot of solutions uh, uh, in water treatment. Uh, drop by drop, there are a lot of innovators like that in Israel, for example. But uh, when we speak about large industrial developments and uh, findings, when we speak about millions of cubic meters of water, then the question arises. For example, we have uh, um, a f discovery for 10 cubic meters an hour, but now we need a technology for 10,000 cubic meters an hour. And there is a huge gap between such technologies. Do you think that uh, we have competitive advantage in Russia uh, because we know how to use huge amounts of water? One year ago, I would not be able to answer this question because uh, we never thought uh, about uh, such problems one year ago. So one year ago, we 
didn't think much about uh, our equipment and technology, but uh, changes uh, happened, uh, some aspects changed our points of view. First of all, uh, I personally think uh, that efficiency of uh, every um, water supply and water treatment facility depends uh, on energy efficiency and on the cost of uh, one cubic meter of water. I can tell you that nowadays uh, it is eight, uh, the ratio is 8% in St. Petersburg. In Europe, this ratio is uh, sometimes 25%, sometimes 30%. You mentioned uh, that we know how to work with big amounts of water. Recently, uh, the situation was like that. Uh, now, unfortunately, uh, we have lack uh, of uh, new findings, uh, uh, new developments, and uh, within uh, the next two or three years, uh, we need uh, to develop our engineering basis. But uh, we have never designed uh, uh, such things before. We just uh, used uh, the Western equipment. We used their designs, uh, and the most modern facilities were equi equipped according to the European standards, but uh, now the situation has changed. Um, it's uh, the situation connection with the sanctions uh, that we have nowadays, and now we have started to construct a new facility. It was not designed by us, but up to 87% uh, of equipment was produced in St. Petersburg, and I don't think that uh, it's a huge problem for us. Um, and I can tell you that uh, this uh, we can address these issues, we can solve this problem. 13% uh, of equipment uh, is not a big uh, amount that we, we will take uh, from European countries. Yes, we have experience in working with huge amounts uh, of water, not only St. Petersburg, but also other cities of Russia produce such equipment for water supply and water treatment. But what we need uh, is uh, to educate uh, professionals and to raise uh, the level of uh, engineering. Really briefly, I represent a water startup. For two years we are working with water. I'm a lawyer as my basic education. I'm not a chemist, I'm not a technologist. But I work with water, and for many years uh, I'm trying to cope with the uh, uh, knowledge shortage. When I present an idea on the market, when I know exactly how this product works, when you calculate yourself that you can use water not from the canal but from an open source, and then you calculate the, the cost, you calculate the cost of the equipment and the final costs, and, and then you see that your water is cheaper than the water from the canal. So it's clear I can sell this program, I, I can sell this product. And then, you go, then I go to the, to the future consumer and I, I talk to them. I forget about chemistry, I forget about technology, and I'm talking with him uh, uh, on the language of money. So I can make money by myself and I can make money uh, for, for my client. Okay, I think, oh, play. go ahead. This will have to be the last, yeah. There it is. Dear colleagues, a very specialized question about decontamination. Mr. Karmazinov mentioned it already. And so my question, do we have any choice in decontamination? Have you used any alternative ways of decontamination? What is the most prospective technology? If you want my opinion, I can answer. Chlorine used as a universal decontamination agent is not a, a unique solution. Uh, it doesn't work with viruses. We can only cope with bacteria and germs. So we have three ways, UV, ozone, and dioxide of chlorine. 
membranes, I don't think that we have a 100% guarantee to eliminate viruses. Obviously, a water scarcity uh, is something that we could discuss uh, for days. Uh, this has been very interesting, very informative. Please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists for this discussion.